The rabbis called him the weeping prophet. They said that he began wailing the moment that he was born. When Michelangelo painted him on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, he presented him in a posture of despair. His face is turned to one side, as befits a man who has received the blows of many troubles. His shoulders hunched forward, as befits a man who has been weighed down by the sins of Judah. His eyes cast down, as befits a man who can no longer bear to see the Lord's people suffer. His hand covering his mouth, as befits a man who no longer has anything left to say. He looks like a man who has weeped and weeped and weeped and has no tears left to shed. His name was Jeremiah. He was a preacher's son, the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests. He was born in the village of Anathoth, close enough to Jerusalem to see the city walls and yet distant enough to live at the edge of the wilderness where the hills sloped down to the Dead Sea. He labored as God's prophet for 40 years or more, from 627 B.C. to sometime after 586 B.C. That's a long time to be a weeping prophet. He lived when Israel was a doormat between three great empires, Assyria to the north, Egypt to the south, and Babylon to the east. He served and suffered through the administrations of three Judean kings, Josiah the Reformer, Jehoiakim the Despot, and Zedekiah the Weathervane. He was a prophet during the cold November winds of Judah's life as a nation, right up to the time when God's people were abandoned and deported to Babylon. Jeremiah himself was exiled to Egypt, and he died there. All that suffering began with a divine call. Verses 4 and 5 of chapter 1 of the book of Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Verse 5 mentions the wonderful things that God did for Jeremiah before he was even born. God knew Jeremiah, and he formed him, and he set him apart, and he appointed him as a prophet to the nations, all before Jeremiah drew his first breath or shed his first tear. This verse is rich in its doctrinal and practical content. First, it proves that God is the Lord of life. God formed Jeremiah in the womb. Jeremiah had biological parents, of course, but God himself fashioned him and knit him together in his mother's womb. When our children ask us where babies come from and we tell them that they come from the Lord, we are giving them good theology. And that's not bad science either. God is the Lord of life, and he uses the natural processes which he designed himself to plant human life in the womb. Second, this verse proves that a fetus is a person. A person is a human being created in the image of God, living in relationship to God. This verse testifies that such a personal relationship between God and his child takes place in the womb and even earlier. Birth is not our real beginning. Conception is not our real beginning. In some ineffable way, God has a personal knowledge of the individual that precedes conception. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. That is the strong, intimate Hebrew word for knowing. The same word that you would use for sexual intimacy between a husband and wife. What a beautiful thing for God to say to his children. I knew you. I 
loved you. I cared for you. I had a relationship with you. I made a personal commitment to you in eternity past. What a beautiful thing for believers to say to their children, even before they are born, God knows you and he loves you and he has made a personal commitment to you. What a wonderful comfort this is for mothers who have had miscarriages, for parents who have lost babies in infancy, even for women who have aborted their own babies. God knew your child, and he knows your child. Third, this verse proves the eternal election of God. If you want to know who you are, you have to know whose you are. For the Christian, the answer to that question is that you belong to Jesus Christ. Now, when did that start for Jeremiah? When did he start belonging to God? When did God choose Jeremiah? Before you were born, I set you apart. Even as Jeremiah was carried around in his mother's womb in Anathoth, God was planning his salvation and his ministry. God set Jeremiah apart. That is to say, God sanctified Jeremiah. To set something apart is to sanctify it, making it holy, dedicating it to holy service. God elected Jeremiah. He consecrated him. He sanctified him. How appropriate it is for Jeremiah to call God the sovereign Lord in verse 6. God is the sovereign Lord. Salvation comes from him and from no other. He not only forms his people in the womb, he sets them apart for himself from all eternity. That's true for every believer. Divine election is not unique to Jeremiah. You did not choose me, Jesus said to his disciples, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. That's what Paul wrote to the whole church in Ephesians 1. This is for the comfort and for the thanksgiving of every believer. God not only knows you, he chose you, and he did it before you were even born. Fourth, this verse proves that every believer has a calling. And I don't just mean a general calling to salvation. Every believer has a special calling to a particular sphere of Christian ministry and Christian obedience. Jeremiah was not just set apart for salvation. He was set apart for a particular vocation. God had work for Jeremiah to do. He had a mission for him to accomplish, a message for him to carry to his own generation. Jeremiah's unique appointment was to be a prophet to the nations. God intended his ministry to have an international scope. Part of what it means to be a prophet to the nations is to proclaim God's grace to the nations, like Jeremiah does in chapter 3, verse 17. All nations will gather in Jerusalem to honor the name of the Lord. But to be a prophet to the nations also includes announcing God's judgment upon the nations. By the time we get to the end of this book, we will see that Jeremiah has pronounced God's sentence of judgment upon every nation from Ammon to Edom, from Babylon to Philistia. Just as all nations receive God's grace, all nations are subject to God's sovereign justice. Now, we don't receive the same call Jeremiah received. Being a prophet to the nations was Jeremiah's call for Jeremiah's time. And this passage is mainly about his call, not your call. But you do have a call. God not only knows you and chose you, he has a plan for your life. Now, you may not know what that call is yet. If you're not sure what your calling is yet, then you need to do these two things. First, you need to do everything that you already know God wants you to do. You can't expect to be ready for God's call or even to be able to recognize God's call if you're not obeying what God has already revealed to you. 
And I'm talking about the obvious things like spending time in prayer and the study of the word, serving the people that you live with, being actively involved in the church, being a witness for Jesus Christ in the world and so forth, all those things. Secondly, you need to ask God to reveal his calling to you. If you ask, he will answer. James chapter 1, verses 5 and following is the passage for believers who want to hear God's call. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. Well, what about doubting? What did Jeremiah do with his calling? He received a divine call, but he was still a dubious candidate. Jeremiah had two objections to God's call, his lack of eloquence and his lack of experience. Verse 6, Ah, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am only a child. Um, wait a second, Lord, about this whole prophet to the nations thing. I'm not too sure about it. Doesn't seem like that great an idea. I'm getting a C in rhetoric at the synagogue, you know. Besides, I'm just a teenager. Now, take your eyes off your Bibles for a moment. Don't look at verse 7. Was it right for Jeremiah to object to God's call like that or not? Was he being humble or just fearful? One way to answer those questions is to compare Jeremiah's call with the call of other prophets. When the Lord reaches out his hand and touches Jeremiah's mouth, as he does in verse 9, that may remind us of the way that the Lord touched Isaiah's lips in Isaiah 6. In that great passage, Isaiah saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And the seraphim were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. When Isaiah saw all that, he had one or two doubts about his calling. But his doubts were different from Jeremiah's. Isaiah's problem was that he was a sinner. Woe to me, he cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Isaiah didn't doubt his ability, he doubted his integrity. When the seraph flew from the altar to touch Isaiah's lips with a live coal, he said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. That's different from what happened to Jeremiah. When God touched his lips, it was to give him God's word, to put the word in the mouth. Well, what about the call of Moses? Was that like Jeremiah's call? If you turn back to Exodus 4, you can see that Jeremiah's objection sounds a lot like the objections that Moses made when God called him. This is what Moses said, chapter 4, verse 11. O oh Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. That's verse 10, actually. Moses did not doubt his integrity. He doubted his ability. He didn't have doubts about his righteousness. He doubted his competence. And that was Jeremiah's objection. I do not know how to speak. Jeremiah wasn't sure what to say or how to say it. He may even have been concerned about his foreign language skills since God was calling him to be a prophet to the nations. I was wondering this week if perhaps his Akkadian and his Ugaritic were a little shaky. In any case, Jeremiah was dubious because he didn't think he could do the job. Now, does God accept that sort of excuse? When God gives his servants a clear calling, does he allow them to argue that they're not qualified? The Lord said to Moses, Who gave man his mouth? Now go. I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. He said pretty much the same thing to Jeremiah. Verse 7, Don't give me that stuff. 
Do not say, I am only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. And then in verse 9, Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. God treated Jeremiah the way that he treated Moses. He does not deny the basis of Jeremiah's objection. He does not argue with Jeremiah about his speaking credentials or quibble with him about his age. There may well have been some substance to Jeremiah's doubts. But God exposes Jeremiah's false humility for what it really is, lack of faith. Jeremiah had forgotten that God is not limited by human weakness. God possesses in himself everything that Jeremiah needs to answer his call. In fact, enabling weak tools to do strong work is God's standard operating procedure. His entire workforce is filled with dubious candidates. When the Lord calls a man or a woman to do a job, he gives that man or woman the gifts needed to get the job done. And notice that Jeremiah couldn't even get away with saying that he was a youngster, because when the Lord calls a child, he provides the child with everything he needs to answer that call. Now, this does not mean that your gifts or abilities don't matter when you're trying to figure out what the Lord wants you to do with your life. They do matter. If you don't know what God is calling you to do, then you do need to take an honest look at the gifts that God has given you. You may even need the help of the Lord's people in that evaluation process. But the call of Jeremiah does mean that if you know what God has called you to do, you can trust him to equip you to do it. As we continue to study Jeremiah, we will be amazed at the ways God equipped him to be a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah was a polymath, a great scholar, a man of prodigious learning in every subject. He was able to converse in the fields of politics, economics, comparative religion, geography, theology, botany, zoology, anthropology, military strategy, architecture, industry, agriculture, fine arts, and poetry. If God has really called you to do some job, then he will do for you what he did for Jeremiah. He will give you everything you need to do that job. If you are coming to some certainty about what the Lord wants you to do with your life, then get busy, trusting that the Lord will give you the grace to answer his call. Just to give one example, these verses ought to be a particular encouragement to those who are planning to do cross-cultural missions. Jesus Christ is Lord of the Word, and he is Lord of all languages. And just as he gave Jeremiah the words to say, so he will give you the words to say. Once God had issued his divine call, and dealt with his dubious candidate, he gave Jeremiah a dangerous commission. You say you want me to be a prophet to the nations. Could you be a little more specific, Lord? You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you. Frankly, that sounds a little ominous. God doesn't spell things out, but you can tell he's giving Jeremiah a dangerous commission. Do not be afraid. That's the kind of reassurance that tends to make you a little bit afraid. The more people tell you not to be afraid, the more you start to wonder what kinds of things you ought to be afraid of. It's like the king who sent one of his knights off to rescue his daughter, the fair princess. And just as he rode away from the castle and just as the drawbridge was closing, the king yelled down from the ramparts, Don't be afraid of the dragon. Dragon? What dragon? You didn't say anything about dragons. And what's this business about being rescued? Verse 8. That makes a prophet worry a little bit, doesn't it? Rescued from what? God does not promise that Jeremiah has nothing to fear or that he will not need to be rescued, but he commands him not to be afraid and he promises to rescue him. 
The reason that Jeremiah didn't need to be afraid was that he had the promise of God's presence. I am with you, the Lord said. That was the same promise that God gave to Moses and to Joshua and to all his children. I am with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Julio Rubal understood that promise. He understood both the danger of the prophet's commission and the comfort of God's presence. I don't know if you've heard of Julio Rubal. He was the Colombian evangelist that God used in recent years to bring renewal to the Colombian church. He was a great enemy of the Colombian drug cartels, and his life was in constant danger until he was finally gunned down by assassins. And yet, before he died, Julio Rubal said, I know that I am absolutely immortal until I have finished the work that God intends me to do. God was with Jeremiah in the same way. Jeremiah, too, was immortal until he had finished the work that God intended him to do. And not only did Jeremiah have God at his side, he also had God's word on his lips. We've noticed this verse, that the Lord reaches out his hand and touches Jeremiah's mouth. This is another connection between Jeremiah and Moses, by the way, because God promised in Deuteronomy 18.18 18, that he would raise up a prophet like Moses. I will put my words in his mouth, God said, and he will tell you everything I command him. You see, when Jeremiah speaks in God's name, God is the one doing the talking. Who wrote the book of Jeremiah? Well, from one point of view, these are the words of Jeremiah. That's what the scripture says in verse 1, the first verse of the book, the words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah. But from another point of view, these are the words of God himself. In verse 2, it says, the word of the Lord came to him. The Bible is never embarrassed to speak this way. There's a meaningful sense in which these are the words of Jeremiah. They give us a glimpse of the personality and experiences of the man, Jeremiah. But at the same time, the Holy Spirit is the one who breathed out the words of the book of Jeremiah. When we read them, we are not just seeing God through Jeremiah's lens. God is speaking to us directly through his word. It is not a contradiction to say that Jeremiah is Jeremiah's word and God's word. And that connection between God's word and the prophet's word explains why Jeremiah has authority over nations and kingdoms, as it says in verse 10. He is not speaking on his own behalf, but on God's behalf. God is sovereign over the nations, and he rules them by his word. When prophets speak in God's name, they are mightier than kings. Even when preachers preach according to God's word, they are mightier than presidents. When I was interviewed by the pastoral seeking committee of this church, it was pointed out to me that 10th Presbyterian Church can be an intimidating place to preach. In addition to the high level of maturity and biblical learning among the members of the congregation, we frequently have scholars among our guests. So one of the members of the committee mentioned the name of a learned theologian who often attends here and asked me, would you feel comfortable preaching to so-and-so? Before taking the time to really think about that question or how it should be answered, I blurted out, yes, I'd preach to the Queen of England. And I think that was the right answer. God rules the nations by his word. And so those who have been appointed to speak God's word have a spiritual authority over the nations. The Lord instructed Jeremiah to be a bold prophet, not because of his preaching ability, not because of his age and experience, but because he was called to speak God's own word. That wasn't always easy for Jeremiah to do. His commission was not only dangerous, it was also depressing at times. Already in the preface to Jeremiah, in verse 3, we learn that the book of Jeremiah does not have a happy ending. It ends in the fifth month of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, 
son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. The book of Jeremiah is a tragedy, not a comedy. It is about the unraveling of a nation, about the decline of God's people from faith to idolatry to exile. You can also tell that Jeremiah's commission is going to be depressing from the verbs the Lord uses to define his ministry in verse 10. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Jeremiah's job description includes six tasks, and four of them are negative. When Jeremiah makes a prophecy to the nations, two to one, his words will be words of judgment. To uproot is to dig nations up by the roots and to turn them under. It's a word that Jeremiah uses more than all of the other biblical writers combined, often to describe the uprooting of idols. To tear down is to tear down an existing structure, like knocking down a city wall or toppling a tower. To destroy, that's another word for knocking things down. And then to overthrow, that's to demolish, to bring to complete ruin. Once the Lord uproots and tears down and destroys and overthrows a nation, not much is left standing. We're going to get plenty of that kind of judgment in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 1 verse 10 is not only Jeremiah's job description, it's a plot summary of his book. I suppose Jeremiah 1 verse 10 is what you ought to find in the Cliff's Notes version of the Old Testament. To uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Jeremiah lives in such evil days that it's judgment before grace, two to one. But grace will have the last word. When the cities of evil have been torn down and plowed under, God will start from scratch. He will begin a new work. He will plant and he will build. He will bring renewal out of demolition. That's what God does with the kingdoms of this world. He is the one who is in charge of the beginnings and endings of history. He is the one who uproots some nations and plants others. He is the one who tears down some kingdoms and rebuilds others. That's also what God did in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. The temple of Jesus' body was uprooted and torn down from the cross. It was destroyed and overthrown into the grave. That was God's judgment against the sin of humanity. But God built and planted resurrection life in the body of Jesus Christ. And then God builds and plants that same resurrection power into the life of every believer. First, the Holy Spirit uproots and tears down sin in your heart. And then he plants faith and builds obedience in your life. You were such a dubious candidate at the beginning. You really were. And yet the Lord has done this work of grace in your life. He has known you from all eternity. He has set you apart for life in Jesus Christ. And if he has done all that for you, will you go wherever he wants you to go? Will you say whatever he tells you to say, even when that commission is dangerous? Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we say in our hearts, yes, we will. Yes, we will go wherever you want us to go, and we will say whatever you want us to say. We place ourselves at your disposal the way that Jeremiah did. We know that we don't have the strength for that task in and of ourselves. So we ask for the grace of your Holy Spirit to go with us, to protect us, to rescue us. We ask that you would be with us as you were with Jeremiah, both now and forevermore. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.